You're listening to Crushing Classical, how to thrive in your creative career. I'm your host, Janet Ingle, oboist, entrepreneur, author, and business and creative coach for musicians. Today on the podcast, you'll hear my interview with Bill Luth, the president of KDFC San Francisco and the vice president of marketing and sponsorships for USC Radio Group. We talk about how his passion for classical music led to three decades in the radio industry, what the future of classical radio looks like, and what the institutions of classical music, including radio, need to be doing to move forward. I hope you enjoy this episode. Bill Luth is a San Francisco Radio Hall of Fame inductee and currently the president of KDFC and vice president of USC Radio Group. During his 30-year career in both public and commercial radio, Bill has left a meaningful impact on the classical music community. Now, I've been working in orchestras ever since I graduated from conservatory, but it was only after I arrived in South Bend and started serving on the orchestra committee and acting as liaison to the board and helping to negotiate our contracts and being friendly with the staff of the orchestra that I had any idea what went on behind the scenes. Because again, this was not taught or even hinted at during my performance degree. I didn't understand what it meant to be a nonprofit organization or that that required so much fundraising. In my mind, nonprofit was code for we don't care about money. And it was eye opening to realize just how egregiously wrong I was. I've been frustrated at the conservative programming of so many orchestras and their seeming reluctance to change anything about the way classical music is presented, but I hadn't realized that everything has to be a conversation with the audience and that an audience has to be educated to accept newer music and that all of this directly impacts the money which the orchestra needs. Now, I'm sharing all of this naivete from my previous self to explain why I'm so happy to have this conversation with Bill Luth. Radio is different from concert halls, and as much as I didn't know about arts management, I knew even less about classical radio, and it was fascinating for me to hear what kinds of metrics and philosophies are at play behind the scenes. So I hope that you will find this as interesting as I did. Uh, Make sure you stay till the end for a little discussion about what it takes to get radio play as a self-produced artist. I know you will enjoy this interview. Remember when I interviewed Heidi K. Begay back in episode 12? She is all about helping musicians to thrive and grow, and she's one of the creators of the Ultimate Music Business Summit, which will take place in January of 2023. This event will feature more than two dozen expert presentations and live panels over three days. I'll be one of the presenters, but I'm even more excited to attend myself and to learn from the experts in various aspects of our music business. Early bird tickets are on sale this month, and I have a special link in the show notes to get you connected to this summit. If you're building your own creative business or thinking about it, you might want to look into the Ultimate Music Business Summit. Bill Luth, welcome to Crushing Classical. Thank you. It's good to be here. I'm delighted to get to speak to you because I feel like I know about classical radio because it's, you know, on in the car and easy to find. And also, I know nothing about classical radio. Um, Could we begin this conversation with you just introducing yourself to our listeners and let us know, like, let us know. Sure. I'm, I'm, I'm Bill Luth, and I'm the president of KDFC Radio in San Francisco, also the vice president of marketing and sponsorships for the USC Radio Group that we now call Classical California, which is inclusive of KUSC Los Angeles. So between the two markets and the uh, the individual stations we have uh, beyond those two markets, like in Palm Springs and Monterey, Carmel, and Santa Barbara, we have close to a million weekly listeners. Wow, that's a ton. How how did you find your way into radio, into classical radio? Yeah, did you I always started, know this was? 
Well, I always talked a little funny. And so <laughs> I, <laughs> since I, my voice changed, said, you should be in radio. And I'm like, I don't want to be in radio. I want to be a musician. I was a trumpet player and I ended up being a uh, getting a master's in opera as a performer. And while in grad school, fell into a little part-time job that took me a, into a left turn into the broadcast world. And I've done that ever since. Fabulous. Were you uh, an announcer initially? Were you doing your own programming? What what does that look like? Yeah, so it was in Lincoln, Nebraska, um, a little public station at the time, really great organization these days. And it was uh, hosting a, a choral music show. So I knew the, the repertoire a little bit. They let me program it. And then a couple of weeks later, they asked if I would do middays. And six months later, they asked me to be the program director, which I didn't know what that was, but I said yes. And then about two years later, I got lucky and scored the morning drive position on a commercial classical radio station in San Francisco. And then eventually became its program director. And then all kinds of things happened after that. Can I ask the dumb question of like, what is the role of a program director if the individual hosts get to do their own programming? Well, ultimately, uh, so it depends, right? So in our world, the KDFC, KUSC world, primarily the hosts do not program the station. We have a music department mm -hmm. and some of the hosts can weigh in on it, but it's it's programmed with a, uh, with a philosophy of format that we do all day long, except for some specialty shows. Some stations do have hosts who pick. Um, they're different, usually smaller stations, I would mm -hmm. say, smaller market stations. And I don't know, I guess that's about all I could describe it. Um, so a program director helps train announcers, schedule announcers, set a philosophy about what kind of music we're going to play, when and why, maybe pick specialty shows. That's, that's the kind of things a program director does. So like my ears perked up when you said the philosophy of the format and the philosophy of when you're programming what and why. Can you, like, I'm fascinated. The craft of these experiences is so interesting to me. What kinds of things go into that philosophy of, of the format? Well, it what depends on the programmer, depends on the priorities of, a, of the radio station um, and how much, you know, training ultimately some of the people are involved, you know, what, what have they gained to know about radio? And that's all over the board across America. But an example is understanding that radio is not a concert hall, that it's for a broader based audience than those who might go to the symphony and the opera and the chamber music concerts, that it has the potential to be more than that. That's sort of our philosophy. It's probably always been my internal compass that that we can get more people to enjoy this music if we understand their needs a little bit better and fully realize they weren't all music majors like I was, that they may hear music differently. They may want to know more. They may use it for different reasons because radio is something you listen to while you're doing something else primarily. Yeah. So sure. there are certain people in an audience on radio who really want to put the headphones on and really think about it. But most people don't. That's not really how they use the radio. Um, and so understanding that and, and when to program what. And not everybody agrees on this. So these are, you know, I have my opinions about this and I have the stories of what works for us. But it's not necessarily a universal philosophy. This is just sort of our philosophy. Yeah, sure. That's it's so interesting. Actually, and it makes perfect sense when you say it, that the radio is not like a concert hall. People aren't there for a for an experience of an evening. And which which makes very clear to me why I feel like anytime I click onto a, a public radio station, a classical radio station, um, I hear some sort of flute and harpsichord, something or other, just sort of diddling along in a Baroque style. Um, or I'll hear and I, I, I don't mean to be scornful, um, but as a, as a classical musician myself, I feel so passionately about bringing new music to audiences and um, pushing the limits of what listeners will listen to in the interest of keeping classical music a living art. And until you said that, I hadn't given it any thought, honestly, until we were in this conversation. You'll hear my dog in the background. We're just letting that happen. She's protecting us from other dogs. Um, before I was in this conversation, it didn't, I hadn't thought um, about 
the the different role of a classical station. So do you feel like it's part of your job or part of your does it fit in your philosophy anywhere to is, yeah. bring to bring more living composers to bring more newer music because like classical music is a living art i would look at it this way the way we uh -huh. look at it because yes of course we all want this to survive and thrive whatever the yeah. definitions of that are and that can be anywhere from something super approachable, mainstream and familiar to something that's more gnarly and, and harder for most people to understand. And the mm -hmm. arts are like that in general, right? That sure. visual art's the same, there's all dances like that. Um, so choosing sort of where you're gonna sit in that ecosystem is what's important. So we made a choice of what's our role in that ecosystem for California. It's you know, large markets of San Francisco and Los Angeles, you know, markets four and two. Mm -hmm. uh, what's, our, what's our place? So yes, we do broadcast the LA Phil, we broadcast the San Francisco Symphony. Those are, those are companies or, or orchestras that do press those, um, those limits of, of, the, of the new music coming out and present yeah. that and share that. Sure. Um, so we we offer that to way more people than actually go to those concerts, right? The people, how many right. people hear it on the radio is sometimes five to 10 times as many people who could fit in the concert hall for that, that same concert for our market. So mm -hmm. we do that service. That's part of our service. We have the Metropolitan Opera broadcast that can go anywhere from La Boheme to, you know, Schoenberg, you know, so mm -hmm. whatever they might be showing or list or, you know, presenting sure. uh, in audio, we will have that. But most of the time, our job that we believe is to be the gateway because broadcasting is broadcasting. Yeah. It's for everyone to enjoy. Our mission is nurturing or a vision statement, I guess, formally is nurturing a love of classical music for all. So that doesn't mean for musicians. It means mm -hmm. for all. And really understanding what do most people want most of the time. So we actually find out we're one of the rare uh, radio companies that does the research with audience that does go out and find out. And I've been doing that for 20 some years. I've been lucky enough in my career to be able to do that. So there's not mm -hmm. assumptions of, well, they must like this and they better like this because they really need to know this is what we learn in music school. It's sort of the ought to camp. You ought to hear this. Mm -hmm. But on the radio, people can very quickly go, no, thank you, with the click of a button, as right. opposed to a captive audience sitting in a concert hall watching all of the, the multi-sense um, experience, which is yeah. what's cool about the concert hall and the intimacy of that. And you sit there and you enjoy it collectively with the people next to you, but you get to you get a visual experience, you have mm -hmm. There's so many different things that you can focus on when you're on the rate, when you're listening to the radio and you're trying to get your email done and you're listening to something that you're enjoying and it's Beethoven. Great. But in some cases, if you start putting things on, are going to be just hard to be compatible with your activity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There are limits. So we consider those. So that that's, I guess, the difference on how we approach it, that it isn't primarily this focus on how to promote new music because the greater love is in the standard repertoire. That's the core base of classical music. Mm -hmm. sure. But we had a lot of composers, um, both persons of color, women composers, and certainly performers of both categories. We, we play probably close to a third of our music is either performed by or written by. So we do believe in that. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, it's really because, again, it's this gateway. It's this welcoming. We want people to feel like anybody's invited. So how far are we going to go with that music in terms of how challenging it is? That might have limits. But in terms of it being currently composed or newly composed, we're very open to that in the mix. But people still like Mozart and Beethoven and Brahms sure. and Tchaikovsky the most. So that's just sure. the way it is. Sure. Yeah. And, and like those composers are never going to go away in the orchestral world either, of course, right. Right. Um, because it's 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 great stuff. But I, I definitely take your point about like we don't if the radio is primarily to be soothing background for <clears throat> non-musicians, actually, because I find that I can't listen to classical music while I'm answering emails because I get too interested, um, too engaged in whatever is going on. But then yes, absolutely. So in a way, it's uh, your you said you said gateway, which is perfect. It's like the gateway drug for 
oh, maybe I like this. Maybe I should check out a symphony concert. Maybe I should go to this chamber music concert that's happening in my area. Maybe I should. We very much believe in that. That's exactly, yeah. that's exactly it. So, you know, the other service we do is we offer classical music of some form, mm -hmm. mostly the, the great artists that you've heard of, but lots of other stuff you've never heard of. I mean, we play within a week, we play 400 different composers. Most people can name sure. five to 10, right? So um, there's still a great variety compared to anything else you would get in an experience that you can go to a concert hall for three pieces on a concert. We offer something that any time of day, 24 hours a day, you push the button, you get nothing but classical music. Mm -hmm. And that also is the service, but it doesn't mean at any time of day, you're going to get exactly what you want when you want it, because that's not broadcasting. That's no, that's all. streaming. That's on demand yeah. streaming. We have yeah. alternate streams for other specialties as well. Mm -hmm. we, we do offer different channels, um, but again, they're formatted as more of a radio flow hosted uh, and curated, you know, to have somebody tell you about it, to mm -hmm. bring you along, make you feel welcome um, and make it feel like this is nice to hang out here. And I wouldn't go as far as soothing background as a description, though that is not completely off, but it's certainly not the priority of how we think of it. Sure. We've, we've seen so much of this research every year and every station I've ever worked with. I do once in a while work with stations across the country and this primary reason they turn on the radio for classical music, regardless of their knowledge of music, most people, it is to relax. But it doesn't mean it all needs to be soothing music. That isn't necessarily the definition of relax. You can relax to the finale of Chike 4 if, you're, if that's kind of your thing. You can relax to heavy metal if that's your thing. Um, but we do try to create an environment that you can expect a range that when you tune in and you're in the mood for classical, you know what you can depend on most of the time with us, mm -hmm. especially in the times when most people listen to the radio. And then we'll push the limits a little further out in different parts of the day and parts of the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that's how we approach it. Sure. That makes a ton of sense. And I apologize for my use of the word soothing. I may have gone a little too far myself. But no, um, soothing is legit. It's a, soothing is mm -hmm. true. It's just that... Um, it isn't the only, you know, it, 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 I don't want it left as that's the descriptor because that's not really the programming. It, it's the way it makes you feel, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. 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 Um, they, you, I heard you mentioned that you are working to program more women composers and performers and people of color in both of those roles, which I agree is so important. Has that been a change like over the years that you have been in radio? Have you seen, like, how, how have you seen the programming that you offer and the the way that you think about your audience and your mission change. Yeah, definitely. You know, a couple of things. One is, you know, to backtrack a little bit about what people want to hear on the radio. And again, something that we've actually confirmed in, in detail, which is a rarity. Um, just we're lucky to be in that position that we've always looked for the discovery part, the curiosity part. But at the at the level that isn't necessarily for the musicians who are living a different life, mm -hmm. you know, those who are trained for like you and I are. I'm like you. I can't really listen with classical music as background. Most music right. I can't listen as background. But for those who like it on whenever they're doing other things, it still comes down to a little bit of compatibility. So we've always checked for what's the stuff you love and then mixed in. Here's some other stuff you may not have heard about mm -hmm. so that it. It really always is for curious people and music lovers in general, not for just like classical heads, but music lovers who will love all kinds of music. That's really who our audience is. They come over from a classic rock or even a light rock or a jazz station and but they're in the mood for classical. So now we give it to them. They don't know all the stuff that you're talking about, about new music and all these things. What we're playing for them mostly is a discovery past the top 20 composers that's a discovery. Yeah. You know, that's, that's what is sometimes hard for people to understand who are more insiders is that for the general audience, 90% of what we play probably is a discovery for them, you know, outside the hits, if you will, that they heard sure. in cartoons and the movies. So that that's the way we, we, we think about that. But in terms of, you know, opening this up to be more reflective of our community, if you will. Yeah. That's been a push, a very appropriate push in the last many 
years, maybe, you know, two, three years across the country, lots of stations, mm -hmm. lots of sure. organizations, lots sure. of industries are trying to do this much better and be and be smarter about this. And that is a priority for us. Our evening host, Laura Downs, who's the concert pianist, who also um, has a record label that she showcases lots of African-American composers in America mm -hmm. that influence classical music and have written classical music. And she's on the air for us across the state every night plus performing this music around the country. And she has such a great take on it. There's a perspective on this. She is, she has a, a black father and a Jewish mother, and she has a perspective on, on how this music fits into our lives. It's not about being black music or white music, but it's, it is sharing perspectives of why did somebody like even a Scott started as Scott Joplin, who did mm -hmm. have an influence on classical music. Sure. And why is that true? And then the you know the uh, the various composers that now have been showcased more and more around the country. She's great at that. We are we're launching a Latinx channel that'll be in Spanish and in English. That starts in just a couple of weeks. Um, on, I'm not sure when this podcast airs, but it's we'll be launching it on September 27th. So that'll be something that's new too. That that reaches an audience that'll have a, a Latinx lean to it but it literally is in the language of those people. In California, we have a lot of Latinx people. America sure. has Latinx people who don't have anybody speaking directly with them around classical music and saying, yeah, you're invited too. Whoever likes it, you're invited. Mm -hmm. That's It doesn't have to have all the baggage yeah. that classical music has carried for so long. Fabulous, fabulous. Can I ask another dumb, I don't really understand radio question? Yeah. Um, which is when you say you're launching a new channel, like is there is it literally going to be like a new thing at 88.7 on my dial or is this a streaming channel that is yeah. that people have to find on the, like where where do people discover these new channels? They find them on our websites, they find them on our apps, um, That that's, primarily how it's done. So yeah, the broadcast channel, that doesn't change. We just, some stations have an HD2 or HD3 that for those who have an HD radio, you can dial to, an, but we don't do that. It seems like that's harder to promote and, and help people understand that. Though I respect it, but that's not what we do. Though we do broadcast in HD, we just don't have the alt channels in HD. So mm -hmm. all of ours are streaming channels. So if you go to our websites, you know, it can be either KUSC.org or KDFC.com, or pretty mm -hmm. soon there'll be a classicalcalifornia.org site. There is a site, but it doesn't have the channels on it. Um, that'll be another place people can go who don't think about call letters like KDFC and KUSC. They live somewhere else where those don't mean anything. Um, the, those are places you can get it. And again, our free downloaded apps have all mm -hmm. of our, our options on there. So when we come out with a new, I called it a channel, maybe a stream curated playlist, however you, you want to call it. Um, they're alternative streams for us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you for answering that. Again, I, I'm, I'm asking dumb questions because I genuinely don't understand, but also because I think that an awful lot of people, of my listeners also don't understand this. This is like sort of behind the scenes stuff. So it's fascinating. So like, yeah. this is not hard hitting journalism over here. I'm not trying uh -huh. to gotcha on anything. I'm really just trying to understand, which is interesting. Can you talk about how um, this, this classical California brand that has come out like pretty recently, you, you were saying, and here's, here's what I think that means. I think that that means that across California, you've got a little bit of a unified branding for the classical stations and some like overarching support in programming perhaps and so forth. And does, first of all, my question is, do I understand that right? But my second question is, is that a good thing or is it more fun when all the local markets are all the local markets doing their own thing? Like this is yeah. a dumb question. Maybe. question. No, no, it's a good question. I think it's really important for everyone to understand how few classical radio stations there are. There aren't classical radio stations in every market. In fact, there are, most markets do not have a classical radio station in America. There aren't that many of them. You know, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't have a count on it, but if it's a hundred, I would be, maybe it's around a hundred nationwide. That's not very many. So there's clearly an opportunity to, to have a better impact on keeping this music at the forefront for more people. We have for a long time had a lot of success with audience building and the way we do it, the approach we take, which is somewhat unique and, and mainstream. While some have been influenced by that uh, across the country, it's 
it's not automatic that everybody approaches this, this casual kind of way that we have. So we try to meet people where they are and what they're doing and bring them along. And knowing that maybe 15% of our audience uh, considers themselves knowledgeable about classical music. And maybe 15% of the audience knows absolutely nothing about it. It just sounds pretty. The middle of the audience knows a little and wants to know more. They majored in something else, but they, maybe they played trumpet in high school, you know, like I did yeah. in the choir in junior high. And they have something stuck with them that classical music matters to them. And God love them for that. So right. we like to bring them along through, through what we offer. And we know in California, outside the markets we cover, there's only a station in Sacramento and we get partially into Sacramento. And there's almost nothing else across the entire giant state of California. Yeah. So while we have 10 signals throughout the coast, up and down the coast, there's still lots of California that doesn't hear what we have to offer. And then our California sort of style, our casual hang out with us kind of vibe that's not mm -hmm. serious and it's not um, esoteric and it's not for you know, fellow music majors only. It's really intended to be just, if you like the music, come on in. You can enjoy yeah. it a good time. That's sort of a California spirit. And then we have the innovation of California, where we're in Silicon Valley and Hollywood. And, you know, there's technology and entertainment capitals that we're part of. And we can bring some of that into what we offer, the way we do movie music. We're, you know, we're the Hollywood classical radio station. So yeah. we, we can do, we have a movie music channel. We have... Hmm. Um, you know, in San Francisco, we have opportunities to expand with technologies because we have, you know, so many people who live that lifestyle. So that's why we came up with Classical California was to to broaden um, the potential for people who don't have a classical radio station to find one that they might like with our spirit. And certainly in California, but certainly beyond, whoever likes it is always welcome. And as I mentioned before, call letters don't mean anything outside a local market. KDFC and KUSC are, you know, they don't even mean that much in a market these days. But if you're living in Fresno, KDFC and KUSC mean nothing. But Classical California might be memorable to you and, mm -hmm. and maybe interesting to you. Sure. That makes a ton of sense. Uh, simply rebranding so that people actually know where to find you is, a, is brilliant and more um, organizations could be smarter about their marketing and branding. <laughs> Um, yeah. Also, the other part I think is important. We have deep commitments to our local communities. You know, to your mm -hmm. point, isn't it better to have your local station? Yeah, where you can do that. Absolutely. We have a San Francisco based operation and an LA based operation, one that serves SoCal, one that serves NorCal, sort of like that. Um, but this is on the digital side where it's really hard to do that. So as we expand with more streams, video, YouTube channel, uh, you know, those kind of offerings, then we can do something that's a little more broad based. That makes a ton of sense. Thank you for clarifying all of that. Um, can I change the subject a little bit and talk about and ask about new artists who are living now, who are recording now, who are making things now and who are self publishing their projects like so many of us are doing in so many ways. How do uh, this is a selfish question also. I released a CD back in 2016 and I loved it. I'm not asking you to play it. That's not my question here. My question is how, other than what I did, which was send the CD to a guy I knew at my local classical station and a guy I knew in Chicago at that classical station, both of whom played it, what's, what's the path for somebody who is self-publishing, self-producing, creating their own high quality uh, experience, not through a label because they're part of my whole thing is how possible it is in this internet age, in this age to um, put your material out there yourself and to not have to apply to gatekeepers and knock at gates. And in general, I think this is a good thing. How does a people, how does a person who has self-produced something get radio play if they want it? Yeah, it's depends. It, you know, it's, I hate to answer with depends, but um, I'll see if I can explain. First of all, I haven't run the content side of our business for many years, so I'm not mm -hmm. really in the weeds on the latest sure. in the way that mm -hmm. our 
music staff is and our content team. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to make sure that they would maybe answer this with, with more uh, clarity. But we get dozens of CDs every week. If you walk around our radio stations, you will see the piles of CDs yeah. the music department looks at. It's hard to get their attention. Yeah. It's even harder in the pop music side of things. But in the classical world, when it was coming from major labels, there were a lot of labels with classical music that would, were always producing stuff. And as that kept shrinking and shrinking, there's more of what you're talking about going on because it's easier and easier to do is mm -hmm. to create your own stuff or do it with a, a smaller label that'll just charge you to produce something. Yeah. Um, so we get a lot of that. So it's hard for them to go into all the listening to all the tracks because it's, it's something we like to do and are looking for. And, mm -hmm. but if somebody has a way to get our attention, it's like marketing anything else. How do you get our attention that as opposed to, I play the flute and I hope you play this because I'm really proud of it is what everybody says, except the flute part. Um, but if they have an angle or a title or a theme or a perspective or, or you know, there's that that captures the attention. And then there's going to be the quality. Does it compete? Not compete. Does it hold up to the high level recordings that we're playing from world class musicians all day? Or is it all of a sudden sound like, well, the recording technique was clearly not the same and so we owe sure. that sort of professionalism to an audience sure. at some level too so it is hard you know I, I don't like to say that because we're always looking for those kinds of things um especially the discovery part for us the california musicians that's what that's a highlight for us you know to be able to mm -hmm. like when you gave it to your local station they probably like that and say oh we got to talk about a local you know janet just in the neighborhood and look what she's doing we love that too we have a, a feature every day um, at noon called Play On California. And it features musicians of what they're doing in town or what they're doing digitally uh, mm -hmm. across the state. And then we have an accompanying blog on our websites around that as well. So that's our way of supporting sort of our mission of the local musicians, you know, getting back to what you're saying before. So if you're, I guess if you're in, uh, I don't know, in New Orleans and you have a, a CD you made that you paid to get done, yeah, it's harder. It's just harder. And I don't know if I could help with that other than find a marketing angle that gets the attention of the programmer. Which makes a ton of sense, right? It's it's always in in this new era, it is always about finding a way to cut through the noise. If everybody can release a CD, yours has to stand out. And if I, I can speak directly to the listener at the at this moment and point out that Yes, of course, it has to meet the basic professional standard of what a CD needs to sound like. That's what you said, Bill. And also there has to be some reason for people to listen, whether that is your um, presence on the internet, which is interesting in some way, whether that is the angle that you take with the CD, um, whether that is the the repertoire that you play, which is unique and interesting and has a, a appeal in a market, for example, or has an appeal broadly. Um, but simply recording the Bach partitas again, <laughs> because you've worked on them. That is that, may or may not be helpful. That is so true. It's hard to it's hard to maybe hear that depending on who, you know, who's listening to, to this, who may be a musician trying to get this uh, approach. But repertoire that you hear on a radio station may be way different than what you do in a practice room. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you think about what are you going to attract to an audience when you're performing live? Okay, that start there. Is this appealing even to a, an audience beyond you and your mm -hmm. teacher? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. That's that's always we're you know it's KDFC actually is in one of the buildings of the San Francisco Conservatory, mm -hmm. and. In, and in LA, we're associated directly with USC. You know, both stations are licensed to the University of Southern California, where we have the Thornton School of Music. So we have ways that we're trying to showcase young talent as well. Mm -hmm. But if they're practicing things for technique and virtuosity, doesn't necessarily make that appropriate material for a radio station. It may be right. great for an audition, but it may not be something that in morning drive when people are on their way to work and getting the kids off to school, it may not be compatible in the moment on a radio station. That's all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, it makes it makes perfect sense. And like the more 
uh, I understand your, the more I hear your philosophy of programming and the, the idea that the classical music just needs to be, the classical station needs to be an easy entry point for everybody. Like maybe it's not the moment for that technical attitude you were working on. Maybe that's not even interesting. Yeah, so, exactly. I get to hear practice rooms and I come out of my sure. out of our, our office and, and offices and studios right outside the door of practice rooms. And I just love it. It takes me back to, you know, sure. hang on the practice rooms. I just have like a visceral memory from that in a very positive way. But I hear some of the things you're playing and I, they're incredible and, and, and wonderful to hear the, these people so passionate about keeping this going. But it doesn't always mean that I, I want to say, hey, we should get that on the radio. Because unfortunately, it just doesn't work there. But we also have events. You know, it's another way that we get we get things out to people too. We we have special events around certain kinds of themes. And, you know, we showcase younger talent sometimes in those or different perspectives on the on the repertoire that might go beyond the radio. So there are different ways that a radio station can connect with an artist, uh, depending on the radio station and its capacity. Uh, that that might go beyond just can you get my CD played? Sure, sure. Um, thank you so much. This has been such an interesting conversation about sort of the ins and outs of what it takes to run a radio and what you what you think about as that person who is running a radio. It's really interesting. I really appreciate it. Is there anything that you would like to share that I didn't ask about? Um, I, I'm not, I don't think so. Other, other than, you know, we're in it together. We all have a role to play. I mean, I feel like what we, I know the passion of the staff that I work with is, is all about supporting all of this, but we don't, don't all run identical paths. We have to find how do we fill in the gaps? Everybody has a role to play in that. And whether it's, you know, teaching students to play, you know, musicians that do that are feeding the beast, if you will. Um, and then the, having the events and we have kids events. We have one coming up this weekend for thousands of kids and parents that come and get exposed to classical music. And, and uh, we have little mini concerts and meet the hosts. And, and there's so many ways to find a way to support the world of classical music and keep the crush on classical music going while you're crushing classical. I love your name of that. Um, that's the part that I think is so exciting and why it's fun to talk with somebody like you, Jenna, because I know that that matters to you and it matters to your audience um, and creating perspectives on how we all help, how we all contribute and get rid of that myth of classical is dying. Because I can tell you for us, it is not. It's a We're in growth mode and more and more people just need to find a way to not feel stupid about it and just get to enjoy it on their terms. I, I, I invite the executive directors of, of the, the San Francisco area in periodically, and we kick things around. And they talk about in the concert hall, how the biggest challenge for them is that people don't want to feel stupid. You know, the general director of the opera says, as simple as saying, hey, you don't have to worry about what you want to wear. You can wear anything you want, but it doesn't help people decide what to wear. They realize, oh, people really need to know what do most people wear, not just wear whatever you want, because they're still too intimidated to show up in shorts and go, oh, I look like an idiot in right. shorts at the opera, um, even though the opera department doesn't care. But that that kind of thing um, is interesting that we're all share this need to let the educated musicians bring us through uh, in the classical music, but in a very open way, I think, so more people can feel like they enjoy it and make it so it doesn't feel like a club just for the Kanye Shenti. I think that's, that's the role at least we play in that ecosystem. And then those who have master classes for the students and they and they live streamed for that because that audience loves that. That's awesome too. Um, so we all have our, our thing to do. That is so important. Everything that you just said, if everyone who is in this field of classical music is sort of on the same team of helping the audience to get in at whatever place they're at, whether that's clicking on the radio in the car on the school drop off, whether that's coming to a concert and being welcomed to it and like maybe gently coached in coached through how is this going to go? How is this going to feel? Whether it's coming to like my recital of 21st century oboe music and being 
spoken to all the way through and saying, okay, this is why this piece is chosen. This is why this piece is important. This is why this piece is interesting. It's really important, all of the things that you just said, so that the audience doesn't feel stupid so that they can keep coming back so that they can enjoy what we're sharing. Yeah, that's great. Wonderful. Bill, Lou, thank you so much for talking with me. Thanks for having me on your show. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you enjoyed this podcast, make sure you subscribe on your app of choice and leave a review too, because it really helps us. Don't forget to check out the Ultimate Music Business Summit. It's happening January 5th through the 7th, and it's going to have a ton of value for creative entrepreneurs. You can check out the link in the show notes and grab the early bird discount before October 31st. Our theme music was composed by Dream Vance. You can hear his newest album, Rama, on Spotify and Apple Music and follow him there for more innovative synthwave music. You can find me at JanetIngle.com, which is also where you can pick up a copy of the Happiest Musician book, reach out to me with thoughts or questions about the podcast, or apply for a possibility session to explore your own portfolio career and thriving musical life. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great day.